Okay, well today I'd like, thank you very much for coming, I'd like to talk about some of the work uh, that we're doing, we collectively involved in the analysis of glass are doing on the, on the glass industry, focusing on the Roman industry because uh, this was certainly the largest industry um, uh, before the modern period and equivalently in terms of scale and indeed in its scientific prowess it was more or less equivalent to the industry in 18th century Europe. So it was quite substantial. Now looking at the, um, at the scale of the industry, we're used to thinking of Roman glass when we go to museums and so on in terms of these rather attractive glass vessels. But in fact, um, uh, arguably the most important product of the Roman glass industry was, was window glass. And um, we don't see much of it for reasons I'll come to later. One of those reasons is, of course, what can you write about a sheet of window glass in an archaeological report? Not very much. So it's usually confined to just one or two lines. But it's been estimated um, that the baths of Caracalla in Rome uh, contained around 300 tonnes of glass in the form of glass, mosaic, tessery, the small cubes from mosaics and in terms of window glass. And buildings like uh, Constantine's Basilica in Trier in Germany contained a large amount of glass in the windows. And, and this is uh, one, gives some sense of scale. Uh, you know, it, when, even when we come to vessels, we tend to think of things like the, the Portland vase. This is the one you see in the British Museum. Um, it's in all the publications. Arguably the most famous piece of ancient glass, very beautiful, but far more significant from a Roman point of view are glass uh, containers and transport uh, vessels. And these uh, prismatic uh, container jars contain a lot of glass. So how glass was made in principle it's quite simple. It's a mixture of sand with a flux, something which lowers its temperature. And whereas quartz, quartz sand will melt at around 1700 degrees centigrade, higher than a, a modern steel foundry, um, with 20% with of, of sodium carbonate flux, you can lower the melting temperature down to below 1000 degrees. And so the glass becomes a hot, sticky, uh, uh, a viscous liquid which can be blown rather like uh, gum and, um, and, and shaped in, into vessels. And this is a reconstruction of a Roman glass workshop um, using the sorts of tools that, that, that um, we think the Romans used. Now, when I talk about the long Roman glass industry, I, I tend to start with uh, glass blowing, the invention of glass blowing. Before the middle of the, 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 um, the first century BC, uh, no glass was blown, or hardly any. But in around 50 BC, we get the first hint of, of the invention of glass blowing in this, um, sorry, this assemblage in, in, in Jerusalem. It, this vessel is only small, around uh, 10 or 11 centimeters long. It's very thin-walled, um, but it appears to have been blown uh, from uh, uh, materials like, like this. This is the accompanying debris uh, from this glass, and these are, are glass rods, hollow glass rods. And the glass vessels, the rods appear to have been sealed over at the end, and the glass vessels were shaped by blowing down preformed glass rods. So they heated this end of the rod, they fused it, and then they blew. And for the first time, or one of the first times, because we can't be sure this was the very first time it was done, they started blowing glass vessels. And recent experiments by a German group have shown uh, that, that this, this can be quite a practical method of doing it. Um, now, now, when glass vessel blowing really took off in around 50 AD or thereabouts, they were using iron blowpipes, the sort of blowpipes we're used to today. Um, but it probably started with something like this. And um, 
glass, Roman glass, which is my, the subject of today's talk, is very, very similar to the glass we have in our windows or our storage bottles today. It's what's known as a soda lime silica glass. It contains about 70% of silicon dioxide, uh, a small amount of calcium oxide, and a certain amount of soda as well. And it's the soda, sodium oxide, which, um, which causes uh, the, the temperature to be lo lowered so the glass can be melted. And this is a soda lake in Egypt. It's, it's in the delta, but most of these soda lakes are in a place called the Wadi Natrun, um, uh, about 50 kilometers northwest of Cairo. And um, what you can see is that this, is, this was taken in March, March the 20th, as far as I can remember. And what you can see is round the edge of the lake, you have these white, this white salt forming. And this is a salt rich in sodium carbonate, which was the, salt, was the source of the soda in um, Roman glass. And, and Pliny, who wrote in around 70 AD or thereabouts, helpfully tells us this is the case. And by, by the autumn, um, this material has formed a hard crust on the lake as the lake evaporates. And you can break it out rather like paving slabs. And it can be used for melting. The other components of the glass are potassium and magnesium are very low. A bit of alumina and iron here, and that's from the sand. And so you've got these two components, soda and sand, which, um, which comprise Roman glass. And we have two main types, and this is, this is the basis where most studies of ancient glass based on chemistry start. There were two main sources of flux. Um, in the Bronze Age, and the Iron and, and the Sasanian period, and in, in the Islamic period, in the medieval period, they used plant ash. They burnt plants. They used the ash as the flux with the glass. But in the Roman period, they used this natron from Egypt, and the Byzantine period, and the early medieval period as well. And it's, it starts off sometime around mm, the first half of the first millennium BC, probably uh, in Egypt, but it was soon taken up by the Phoenicians on the Levantine coast. And that, that's where it all started. And we've got this very nice compositional barrier between uh, the, the plant ash glass and the natron glass. Um, and all the Roman glass, virtually, virtually uh, well over 95%, I say well over 98% of the stuff analyzed, falls in this area down there. It's very, very characteristic. So it's based on one type of raw material. And this stuff was, um, was fired in large furnaces. Um, and this, this, we didn't really understand what was going on until around 1995, 1996. Um, we were trying to treat glass rather like a ceramic, where you analyze the material from the kiln, and then you say, OK, they made their pots in this kiln. But that's not really how glass works. Glass is much more in terms of the structure of production, much more like a metal such as bronze. Because these furnaces, which were excavated by uh, Yale Gorin Rosen in, in, in 1993, this is an array. Uh, these are furnace bases here. Each one of these is the base of a furnace. It's a place called uh, Betelieza, just somewhere up here. And um, where is it there? I can't see there. And um, each one of these is about four meters by two meters. It's the base of a glass working furnace. There's still a layer of glass on it. And each of these furnaces, we think, fired eight to 10 tons of glass. These date to the, uh, probably the seventh or eighth century. Um, but um, we have earlier ones from the Roman period as well. And Marie Dominique Nenna, who works in Egypt, has excavated a furnace which appears to have fused 20 tons of glass at one time. And these are glass-making furnaces. You don't, they didn't tend to blow glass vessels from these. They made the raw glass from the sand and the alkali. And so this, is, this slab, uh, again in Israel, the Bet Shereem slab, is one of the few, uh, well, the only complete slab, as far as we know, of glass made in one of these so-called tank furnaces. And so this is a plan. There were two fireboxes at the end. And the, 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 the heat comes in here, hits the ceiling, uh, and it's a reverberatory furnace. The heat is reflected down on the surface of the glass, 
and the glass melts into a slab. And then it's broken up into chunks, um, probably using some sort of hammer. We've got, we haven't got any hammers, unfortunately, but we've got lots and lots of chunks, and they were distributed around the Mediterranean. Um, okay. And so this model has emerged where you've got primary glass making from natron and sand in the east along the coast of the Mediterranean in furnaces like this to make slabs and also down in Egypt where there is, there's the source of natron there are very good sands along this coast the natron is down here and the model we're working to at the moment is that this was broken traded out all over the Roman Empire and in small workshops all around the empire, it was melted into glass vessels. So at the moment, it appears, most of the glass was made in this eastern Mediterranean region. And by doing a lot of analysis of, of dated glass and glass vessels from known contexts and so on, a model is emerging. And Daniel Foy um, is, is the main person uh, responsible for this really. She, she presented it in the first place, but a model's emerging. We have about nine or ten distinctive compositional groups of glass. Throughout the first millennium AD, from around uh, the first century through to the ninth century, there are these uh, uh, eight or ten, you can split them further, but these are the main groups of glass, and each is believed, each one of these symbols is believed to correspond to glass production in one fairly restricted region, in some cases one site. And so we can identify um, where, the, wh wh where the glass was originally made. Now this doesn't tell us where the glass vessel was made. It just tells us where the raw glass was made. We cannot provenance individual glass vessels. We're looking at the transport and the movement of the raw glass at this stage. Um, we've used, I've used um, three components, titanium, aluminium, and silicon there, and they're the easily measurable components of the glass sand. So um, what the composition of, of, the, um, of the glass presented in this way is really, rep is really giving you some uh, first estimate of the composition of the glass making sand. And when we can use isotopes to look uh, uh, closely at the origin of glass and to confirm this model, there are two main is isotopes used in, in glass studies. One of these are the isotopes of strontium along here. Now, strontium isotopes in geological materials vary with time. And um, in fact, um, they reflect, in general, um, particularly in, in, in sands, they're, they're associated with the, the calcium carbonate content of the sand, and they're basically measuring the composition of the seawater when that sand was produced, when the, when the carbonates in that sand was produced. And this uh, ratio here, 0 0.7092, is the ratio of modern seawater, and also it's the ratio for shell. This is the shell being laid down by the shellfish in the sea, and it's the little white fragments you see in the sand on the beaches when you're, when you're on holiday, okay, when you're going for a swim. And these fragments of shell give us this very distinctive uh, strontium isotope composition close to this line for modern seawater. Now, what I've done, I've plotted along this axis the strontium isotope ratios, and this is Western European glass made in the medieval period. It's got a very, very different ratio from the Roman glass from London I've plotted up here in red and the glass from the Palestinian tank furnaces because all this stuff is actually made from coastal sand, whereas the stuff in Western Europe is made from plant, the ashes of plants growing on old limestones. Now, the other isotope along here is the isotope of a rare earth element called neodymium. And unless you're involved in making mobile phones or modern microelectronics, you won't have come across neodymium very much. But it's a rare earth element, and um, it's a very valuable resource. Uh, in fact, 80% of modern rare earths are actually mined in China. 
So there's a lot of industrial as well as academic interest in neodymium. But the interesting thing about it is the ratio changes depending on the age of the rock. And the, eastern, uh, uh, the, the, the sands of the eastern Mediterranean reflect the sand coming down the Nile. The sand comes down the Nile. It's washed around the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. And it all has this very distinctive signature, which is given, actually, by the volcanics which are feeding the Nile up in East Africa. And so we have this neodymium uh, uh, value up here of minus 0.6 to minus 0.4, which is very distinctive of eastern Mediterranean glass, uh, eastern Mediterranean sands. We have the, um, the, the coastal signature of strontium, which, which tells us they were making the glass from beach sand. And virtually uh, all of the, the glass analyzed from, from Europe so far, from the Roman period and from the early medieval period, plots up in this area, all made probably, almost certainly, on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean originally. A massive sort of export industry of raw glass going through uh, the empire and later. And so when we come back to our, um, our, our different groups, actually each of these production groups corresponds as well to not only a different place but a different date. So um, we've got two main regions. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, is this going to work? Yes, glass made in Palestine are these groups down here, and glass made in Egypt are these groups around here, so we think. Um, we've got dates. This is glass made in first to third century Egypt. This is glass made from the third century BC to the fourth century AD in Palestine. As time passes, there's an abrupt change uh, to produce this glass up here in the 4th to 5th centuries. It becomes very, very dominant everywhere. And then you can go through time, centuries, and you get a different glass production for each century, or for each, each period of time. Some of these are only uh, 50 years or so in length, some of these productions. Others are several centuries. But we're getting a very good handle now on the date at which these glasses are produced and whereabouts the glass is coming from. And I'll give you an idea of how we're applying that to address some more detailed archaeological problems in just a little while. But first of all, I'd like to look briefly at coloured glass and coloured glass vessels. Now, there's the Portland bars from the BM, and there's this wonderful um, bowl from the VNA, which give very good indication of the skill which, with which the Romans could uh, uh, manipulate coloured glass. Um, most of the opaque and coloured glass vessels date from the late first century BC through to the first century AD, for reasons I'll explain in just a minute. Um, and the opaque glasses are generally based upon an element called antimony. Antimony, SB, um, they dissolved it in the glass, and when they cooled the glass, it crystallized these tiny particles of calcium antimonate. They stop the light passing through the glass and make it opaque, which is why these, uh, a lot of these glasses are opaque, like this one. Um, uh, if you wanted yellow, you used lead antimonate. It was a complex, uh, time-consuming, and quite an expensive process, because antimony is not a particularly common metal. Now, what seems to have happened is that when they... These, these vessels... Oh, let's go back. Uh, don't tend to be made uh, by glass blowing. They're probably made by a technique called slumping, which preceded glass blowing. You have a, 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 something like a dome, uh, a mould, and you make a disc of glass, you heat it, and you slump it over the mould. That's how these were made. Now, opaque glass suits that sort of manufacture because you have mold left on the interior of the vessel, which means if you have transparent glass, it's not terribly uh, uh, attractive. Um, it's quite a slow and expensive procedure. Um, and the, the components which made the glass opaque were also expensive. So this produced a kind of elite material which, which people used. 
But when glass blowing was introduced, all of a sudden, you could blow very, very quickly transparent, uh, thin-walled glass vessels. You can make a lot of glass vessels. You, out of your eight tons of glass, you can get a lot more glass vessels. They're thinner, they're lighter. Um, and, and it seems that these transparent glass vessels became very, very popular very quickly. And because of the rapid upscaling in production, they soon uh, became quite common on the tables of people of quite middle incomes. You know, they were no longer uh, rich, elite people who used glass. And what we see is a movement of coloured opaque glass from the use in vessels to the use in mosaics on walls at around 60 or 70 AD or about that time. So glass vessels become transparent, um, not always colourless, sometimes tinted, but they become transparent, whereas a lot of the opaque glass is concentrated on, on uh, again, in, in houses for rich people, in the mosaics on the walls. Now, Pliny tells us that that in his, by his time, by, by the time this, this move away from opaque vessels had occurred, that um, the most uh, popular and the most valued glass was transparent and colourless. Now, when glass comes out of the tank furnaces, uh, these, these chunks are usually green or blue in colour. Um, they make bluish tinted vessels. If you've excavated a Roman site, you'll probably be quite familiar with this bluish glass that comes out. But they wanted colourless glass, and they learnt that if you added a small amount of antimony or manganese, in, when you made this, you ended up with a colourless glass like this, which was much more attractive, resembled rock crystal, as Pliny says, and um, uh, took decorations such as carving much, much better. And, and, and so they learnt this technique called decolorization to add a decolorizer, manganese or antimony oxide, to the glass. Now, here's, here's some analysis of a typical Roman manganese decolored glass and a Roman antimony decolored glass. They look quite similar. Soda lime silica glasses, same amount of silica. Sodium and calcium are a bit different, but the real difference is in the manganese. The, the stuff decolorized using manganese obviously has about a percent of that or the antimony in the antimony decolored glass. But when we plot these two up, we can see that not only is there a difference in the manganese and the antimony, but the antimony decolored glasses are different from the manganese ones. The, the antimony decolored glasses have higher soda and lower calcium. And actually, it looks as if these were being made from different recipes or sands, as well as using different decolorizers. The base glasses are different. And what this seems to mean is that um, the manganese or the antimony were added to the glass when they melted it in those big tank furnaces. So they were already making their decolorized glass when they, uh, they uh, fused the enormous tanks. Uh, the people who bought the glass in the glass workshops to blow the vessels they bought it colourless, or slightly coloured or tinted. It was already produced in that way. And this helps us explain Diocletian's price edict. Now Diocletian, the Emperor Diocletian in 301, three, um, was attempting to control inflation, and he introduced an edict of maximum prices, which tried to hold down the prices of commodities so people could afford them. And this is a, a translation of uh, Diocletian's Edict by Marian Stern. And um, uh, he gives the prices of various types of glass. And he says, Alexandrian glass, a pound of that will cost you 24 denarii. Judean greenish glass, this stuff, 13 denarii. The colourless glass is more expensive than the greenish glass, which is what we'd expect. And then he says, you can buy the Alexandria cups and smooth vessels, like these, for 30. So you can see there's, a, there's an upscaling of about uh, a third, or thereabouts, when you make 
the glass vessel from the raw glass gives you some idea of the cost of the labour. And here's a Judean greenish glass cup and again that's up about seven denarii from there, a similar sort of margin in terms of production. And that's, that's quite nice, we can explain that and we do indeed think these are Egyptian from where this sort of glass is made and these are Judean, these are uh, from uh, modern day Israel. But the problem lies with the windows. Window glass, best quality, only eight denarii. And this suggests that in converting best quality glass into window glass, you have a price fall, which has never really made any sense. Similarly, second quality glass, six denarii, again, it's much cheaper than buying the raw glass itself, which, which doesn't seem uh, uh, right. And I'll come now to the explanation for that, because it's quite important. It lies in recycling. Okay? Now, we know that glass was quite widely recycled in the ancient world. We've got um, uh, quotes from classical uh, uh, texts which tell us that broken glass was being bought on the streets of Rome so it could be remelted into vessels and recycled. Um, we've got, in traditional workshops, we have people uh, recycling glass. This is from Tripoli. The, my ex-colleague in the British Museum, Simpson, Simpson, took these photographs. The glass is being cleaned and sorted into different colours to be melted, um, to be recycled. And, of course, we recycle glass ourselves um, uh, to make new vessels. And when we look at our antimony decoloured uh, glass uh, and our manganese decoloured glass, Here's the antimony decoloured glass and here's the manganese decoloured glass up there. Glass which has both manganese and antimony, and there's much more of that than either of these, lies in between the two. And this is the result of recycling, of mixing those two end members, those two uh, pure glasses which were being made in the tank furnaces. And if we look at uh, the glass from this wreck in the Adriatic, analysed by Alberto Silvestri uh, in, in, in Padua, um, we can see that there's almost a, a straight line, a linear relationship between the two. This is the recycled glass down here. Most of the glass down the bottom, rich in antimony, is colourless, the yellow symbols. And some of the glass at the top, the manganese decoloured glass, is colourless. But there's a whole lot of stuff in between which contains both manganese and antimony. And that's tinted. That's more blue. And that's because as you mix the glass and recycle it again and again, the colour spoils. So there's quite a lot of evidence now for glass recycling. And um, this is the sort of stuff we think they used. This is uh, from a little museum display in the Museum of London. Crushed glass vessel and glass window for recycling. And of course, because windows um, include quite a lot of weight relative to light glass vessels in terms of the amount of glass present, they're a very good raw material for recycling. And if you look at glass workshops and the sort of material you find, you also find quite a lot of stuff from these prismatic bottles. And again, these are heavier than glass tablewares, than the glasses you like to drink and eat from, and they form the bulk of material which was being recycled. So what seems to be happening with the window glasses, they're talking about the supply of glass to the workshops, Recy window glass for recycling, rather than the cost of window glass, of newly made window glass. I think that's what's going on there. Okay, now when we come to recycling, one of the things we're interested in is not just um, that glass was recycled, because we're beginning to show that quite successfully now, but we want to know how many times it was recycled. How many cycles does a piece of glass go through um, before it's finished and, and no good anymore? Well, we're not there yet, but this is just a flag up for, for, for the way we're trying to determine this. This is uh, glass, most of this glass I think is from Jordan in this graph from a number of different studies and what it shows is the weight percent 
um, phosphorus up one side and potassium up the other. And here we've got chlorine up here and potassium along here. And what happens is that as you recycle your glass, you're working in a furnace which is, is, is more or less open to the fuel. Little uh, flakes of fuel and dust are coming into the glass from the furnace and contaminating it. And that's what we're seeing here, the glass being contaminated with the fuel as it's remelted. So the further up this line you go, the more you expect the glass to have been remelted and reworked on average. As you remelt these fragments, you, you form a, 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 a kind of stiff liquid and you re-blow the vessels. On the other hand, um, chlorine, which is present in glass, it's, it comes in through the, through the uh, natron, it's a very volatile element. And as you heat the glass, the chlorine is going to be driven off as the glass is heated more. And what you can see is that as the potassium goes up, the contamination from the ash, the chlorine goes down. So I think what we're beginning to do, and one of the things that is really interesting to me is, can we begin to see how intense, how many cycles of recycling cycling were there? How many times was this repeated and so on? And, and this um, idea of intensity is something I, I want to get a hold of. Um, the questions in glass you can answer with glass are different from the questions you can answer with pottery, up to a point. And so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to use glass to kind of answer some of these issues because how intensely a workshop worked gives you an idea of, of the routine people worked to, whether they were seasonal, whether they were peripatetic, and so on. So, um, I'd like to look briefly now at a little glass workshop in London uh, from Basinghall Street. It's, um, that's it. it's this one, Baz 205, just somewhere up here. It's quite near the, uh, the, fo the, the fort in, in, in London. It's a small glass workshop. It's second century, and it's been quite extensively excavated. Um, it yielded masses of glass. Now, because glass is a recyclable material, when you excavate a workshop, quite often you don't find a lot of it left because they're recycling it the whole time. One of the curious things about this workshop is there's quite a lot of glass uh, left over. And um, when it was being excavated, uh, what came out of the ground was a big 30 kilogram lump of glass like this, more pyramidal in shape. Um, we had a lot of moils, and a moil, when you blow the glass on a blowpipe, you always have a small amount of glass left stuck around the end. And these are the, um, these moils, we call these moils, these are the, 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 the residues of the glass around the blowpipe. A glass worker will take his blowpipe, stick it in water, the moil will fall off due to the contraction of the blowpipe, and you end up with a whole load of moils. So we know there's a lot of glass working going on here. And then we have these slabs now, these slabs are only about 10 centimetres thick. They're not as thick as the glass we saw in those big primary glass-making furnaces where they're making the royal glass in Egypt and Israel. But they're, they're, it's quite a substantial amount of glass. And this tells us something about the glass, way glass was being worked because we don't tend to find a lot of crucibles, a lot of pots in which glass was being made. They tend to make it in a kind of bowl or what we call a small tank like this. And this workshop appears to have had a furnace which, which melted a, a, a tank of glass and we still have part of the tank here which, which sat in here, the, these slabs of glass and then at some point the furnace failed and the glass flowed out like this and then they abandoned the workshop. Now, when we look at the composition of the glass we can tell something quite interesting. And so what I've done here is I've analysed two elements, lead and tin, in the glass. Now, why am I showing you those elements? They're quite obscure. They're only present in parts per million. They're quite low concentration in the glass. But if you've recycled glass yourself, I might be able to give you an idea of why they're there. So let's supposing you go along to the bottle bank where you're depositing your glass bottles. Here's a 
colourless glass bin for the colourless glass. Here's a bin for the brown glass and here's a bin for the green glass. But you've committed the social sin of drinking a bottle of Blue Nun. OK, I don't know if you know that rather bad wine. It's sold very widely in Britain. Um, and actually the glass is blue. What are you going to do with that glass when you go to one of those bins? You know it makes a good raw material. Well, to be honest, I don't take it home. I throw it in the brown bin or I throw it in the green bin. Now, what I'm doing there is that blue colour is due to the presence of cobalt in the glass. That's the element that colours the glass blue. And when I throw the cobalt blue glass into the colourless bin, I contaminate the glass with cobalt. It doesn't colour it. It's only one bottle in a hundred. But all the way through, there's a tiny trace of cobalt, which I can detect. And lead and tin make yellow glass. So what I'm measuring here is a contamination of the glass in the furnace due to recycling, due to people throwing coloured glass, incidentally, by mistake or deliberately, into the furnace, into the tank. And so this is a picture of about 50 glass fragments from this uh, site in London. OK? Now, this is the fresh glass. It's not contaminated by tin or lead. It's very, very fresh. It's just like the glass from the coast of Israel. Really good quality stuff. And so this is the stuff we think the glass, glass workers started with. OK? And then, uh, the first campaign of melting, there's a technical term. And then um, they bring in collet. Broken glass bottles, we can identify the collet, and window to, to, to make fresh glass. And that's what we see in these yellow spots just here. And then they seem to have mixed the collet and melted it to make a composition of glass sometime around here. And that includes most of these little round moils we find on the site, any freshly made vessel, and that big uh, lump of glass, that was that, that big flow of glass from the furnace, plus the tank, the, the material from the tank. And it appears that what they did was the glass workers came in, they, they melted their first batch of glass, uh, then they collected their colour, then they made a final melt like this. They didn't seem to do any more after that. The furnace failed and they abandoned it. That's why we find so much glass there. The furnace was aband si abandoned simply, I think, because the, it, there wasn't enough, although there was glass left, there wasn't enough to make it economic to build a new furnace and remelt it. So what we have here uh, is, is, uh, is a workshop which operated for a very short time. And that's what we're finding in the UK. Of course, we're out there on the fringe of the empire, uh, away from the centre of things. But it does appear that these furnaces operated for very short campaigns in general, um, perhaps fired uh, two, maybe three times, we don't really know, but, but not very much. And so um, we have short-lived just a few uh, production events, events where things were made. Um, and we think this is peripatetic glass making. These are glass makers coming from the centre of the empire, or from the eastern Mediterranean, to Britain to make the glass. They then, uh, they then make it and they go away again. And when you analyse glass from houses in Roman Britain, you can see batches. You can see from the composition individual groups of glass which have been made at different times. And this is, this is not, when you look at a, an archaeological site, you see all this pottery and all this glass, you imagine it coming in all at once. But it isn't. It's a punctuated system. It comes in at certain times in, cer in certain ways. And that's what we need to find out about. And that's what we're trying to do with this. OK. So uh, that's, that's the main sort of Roman period, but there are big changes taking place in the fourth century. Okay, this blue, green and colourless glass that was previously made suddenly uh, uh, starts declining quite rapidly. And a new glass, which we call HIMT, high iron, manganese and titanium, here are the elements, 
Here's the eye, high eye, and it's got a very, very distinctive composition down here. Suddenly becomes dominant. This new type of raw glass coming in from different furnaces, from different places. And um, it's this group up here in the red, um, in the red circle. It's Egyptian, and um, it seems to replace the antimony decolored glass. All of a sudden, they stop making glass with antimony. They stop decolorizing it. They no longer make the opaque glass for mosaics colored with an and opacified with antimony. They start using uh, this HIMT glass without antimony. It seems to replace uh, the Alexandrine, the, the, the Egyptian type glass. And when we look at what was going on here, it's quite odd because the glass contains a lot of manganese. And manganese was a decolorizer. And for a long time, we've not been able to understand why this glass was apparently decolorized with manganese when it's usually quite a strong green or yellow green in color. It's quite distinctive. Um, this yellow green is not what you see, it's not the bluish green you see in the early glass, the earlier glass. And um, what we now think is happening is that there, you can see these straight lines here. The manganese and the iron are being added together. So they're not decolorizing the glass anymore. They're deliberately coloring it. They're deliberately making it a yellowish color. And we think that this is what's sometimes called commodity branding, where the Egyptian glassmakers, for some reason, no longer had their antimony decolorizer, could no longer make this colorless glass, which had been more expensive. So they're trying to sell their glass instead on a different basis and they color it yellow green which distinguishes it from the glass from Israel and the reason they think their glass is better is actually it's this blue line here it's because it melts at a lower temperature and it's easier to work now, if you can imagine you're a glass worker sitting in Paris or London or some ancient equivalent city over the other side of the world, and uh, you want to buy raw glass and you want the easiest glass to work. Now, um, someone set, comes along with a basket or, or a sack of glass chunks. You haven't got a clue. They're not stamped like metals to say where they come from. You haven't got any idea uh, what glass you're buying. But by deliberately colouring your glass, you can let people know it's this type. And we're thinking that that's what they were doing at this point. They were trying to encourage people to buy the best quality of glass, the glass with the lowest viscosity that melts at the lowest temperature. And if we look at the soda content of glass through time, we get this quite interesting picture. In this column, are the Egyptian glasses, and in this column are the Palestinian glasses. And what you notice is at any one time, the Egyptian glasses have about 3% more sodium in than the Palestinian ones. They were closer to the natron deposit. They probably had control of the source of the soda for the glass. It, it gave them an easier glass to work, much more popular with the, the people blowing the glass vessels. So um, they made this antimony decolorized glass, which was rich in soda. Um, and, and it was much better than the stiff, bluish, greenish glass of Judea, of Palestine. And Pliny, uh, uh, and, sorry, the, the Diocletian's Price Edict tells us that this, this went for about half as much again as this on the market. HIMT, the um, the, the, colored, the yellowish colored glass, which they think they were deliberately, we think they were deliberately uh, trying to market as a better glass, is here. Hardly any fall in soda content at all, but if you sort of interpolate between here, it's much, much more fluid and melts much more easily than the Palestinian stuff. So um, it looks as if uh, the Egyptians had a competitive advantage in glass making. Their glasses uh, were richer in soda, they melted easier, they needed less fuel, um, they were easier to, easier to blow, and so um, their glasses were, in general were more valued, and that probably is what gave them the opportunity to use the more expensive additive antimony in the first place. 
Now, what happens when the Roman Empire uh, in the West comes to an end in, in the 5th century? And, and to answer that sort of problem, we've been looking at, at some early medieval glasses like these from Anglo-Saxon Britain uh, and, and from France and so on, just to see what people did then. Because at this point, the, um, the trading routes become greatly diminished between the east and west of the Mediterranean, as you know. And so um, we, let's, I take an example. This is, this is a, a grave uh, from southeast eastern Britain, um, a place called Prittlewell. It's a burial of a prince. There are lots of bronze vessels. There's gold. It might look, not look terribly rich from an Aegean point of view, but believe me, in, when you're out in uh, early medieval Britain, this, this was quite a rich grave. And he has several um, glass vessels buried with him, including these blue ones just here. And they are a very distinctive uh, form of glass bowl um, with a kind of cross um, trailing on the surface. Um, there are up to about 20 of these known in, in Western Europe. Most occur in Britain. There's one in Norway and um, one or two elsewhere. Um, and we were interested to know if they were using old recycled glass when the Romans departed, or if they're using fresh glass and, and the imports from the Mediterranean are still getting through to the West. And we can use this diagram to show this. Um, I've cut down the number of, of groups on here, cut out some of the later ones, but here's the Roman glass down here. These are 5th and 6th century uh, glass productions you can find all around the Mediterranean in Europe. And this is the 4th, 5th century HIMT from Egypt. And these are our blue glass vessels. And they plot quite clearly with the 6th century um, uh, raw glass, um, the fresh glass from the Mediterranean. So we know that these are being made with imported glass. Now, the situation is a bit different when you come to glass beads, OK? Um, this is a project done by one of my students, a guy called James Peake, who was really good in the lab. Well, he still is, I guess, but he's doing something else now. But um, he, he looked at Anglo-Saxon glass vessels by taking tiny flakes of glass from down the piercing. And this is, this is about uh, uh, two and a half centimetres across, this disc, and there are 60 small samples of glass in that disc, which he analysed. Um, and that, that's how he did it. Um, these are uh, 6th to 7th century beads. Now, um, uh, Brugman has defined the categories of glass bead. We know which types are found mainly on the continent of Europe and which types are found mainly in Britain. And this is a kind of breakdown of, of what happens. These are uh, the beads uh, mainly distributed on the continent, and these are the types along the bottom here. These are the number of analyses, and these are the beads that are made with, with the forms, with the typologies that are mainly distributed in Britain. And there are a group of up here which are found in both places. But when we look at the compositions, what we find is that the old Roman glass compositions, the blue, mainly occur in the beads made in Britain. Whereas the, um, the beads made on the continent, the beads with continental uh, typologies, but which are found in Britain, are mainly made with fresh glass from the Near East. So it looks as if British bead making in Britain was based on recycled glass, whereas bead making on the continent was based on fresh glass from the East. Okay, and um, when we look at that, we can start thinking about the way these bead makers were organised. Uh, in Anglo-Saxon Britain, the bead makers uh, were using recycled glass. Some vessel glass, the high status stuff, is made from contemporary East Mediterranean glass, and it looks as if these may have been separate crafts, where the beads, bead glass bead making glass vessels, were made separately. The vessel production is kind of linked into international trade. Uh, uh, which is consistent with the high status of the vessels, whereas the beads are much more locally based. 
And similar things are being done elsewhere. For example, this is work by Andrea Ceglia, um, who, who, who did, has done a lot of work on Cyprus in, in, this, in the 6th, 7th, well, 5th, 6th, 7th centuries. And he's looking at the distribution of glass from different sources in different areas on Cyprus and relating it to, to date and place. Now, what happened at the end? We're coming to the end now. I'll try and wind up if I can. Um, when does this Roman tradition of glass making using natron and sand finish? Well, the, the Arab conquest in 632 to 640 really disrupted things. Um, but actually, the, the big change in glass making comes a couple of centuries later, perhaps even as late as 900. Um, and, and they go from making glass with natron to making glass with the ash made by burning plants. So one of the things that's interested people for some time is why does this change occur? Is it kind of culturally related? And if so, how? Um, and if it is culturally related, why does it take two centuries, essentially, for things to change? So um, the original dating was done by a, a very well-known archaeological scientist and pioneer, a guy called Ed Sayer in the 1970s, and by dating, uh, by sorry, analyzing Egyptian weights, where the, the date of the glass weight, the glass coin weight, is, is imprinted on the glass, he, he reckoned this changeover occurred about 845 AD, where the Roman glassmaking tradition with natron finished and the plant ash took over. And um, people have talked about climate change being responsible, political upheavals in the Egyptian delta, uh, local wars and so on for the change from this to this. And so to look at this, uh, one of our students, Matt Phelps, um, he's analysed several hundred uh, well-dated glass vessels dated on the basis of typology and archaeological context from Israel with, the, with Yale Gorin Rosen and her colleagues at the Israel Antiquities Authority. And trying to date this changeover um, as, as best he can. And this is what he finds. This is the kind of summary of what he finds. Um, these spotted uh, glasses up here are the, the glass made in Palestine. And this stuff here is the glass made in Egypt. And this is the new glass made with plant ash, which replaces it. And all the glass he analysed is from Palestine. But what you can see is that natron glass made in Egypt, this blue diagonal stripe here, continues 50 or 100 years, even in Palestine, beyond glass being made in Palestine. So this means that um, they could get access to natron in Egypt for much longer than they did in Palestine, about 50 to 100 years longer. We can't be more precise than that. And the, and the change to plant ash seems to have occurred uh, significantly later. So, so what we see happening is that it's a gradual change. Um, let's skip this one. If we go, go down here, Palestinian glass, by the time you get to the Umayyad period, to around the uh, 7th to 8th century, Palestinian glass has only got 12.5% sodium left. It's incredibly stiff and incredibly difficult to work. Egyptian glass still has about 17 or 16%, this sort of uh, amount. And so this was a better quality glass. The Egyptians had more natron, and so they could go on making glass longer. This isn't an abrupt cutoff of natron production. It's not a sudden climatic or political change. It's a very slow process, which you can see going on over centuries. Natron was not only being used to make glass, it was used in the dyeing industry. It was used probably for medicine and for soap, for detergent. And there's always a competition to get it. And the Egyptian glass makers had access for a lot longer than the Palestinian ones. Now, um, in the north, things get difficult quite quickly for people. Um, it, in, in the western, what was the Western Empire, um, we see quite abrupt, ch quite distinctive changes, but not quite as abrupt as in the East. Natron glass goes on being used for quite some time. In fact, 
we've got the last use of recycled natron glass in Western Europe in around 1100 or 1150 AD. It goes on for quite a long time. Um, but what we see is that as time goes on, you get a lot more contamination of the glass with these elements from colour, these colouring elements, which contaminate uh, the, the glass. And a really good example of this is a place called San Vincenzo in Italy. It's a monastery. It was excavated by uh, Richard Hodges in the 1990s. Um, there it is just there, about 50 kilometres from Monte Cassino. It's an early 9th century monastery, sacked in 881 AD. We've got written record of that. And it has um, a glass workshop attached to it. And at around this time, there's a switch from, from natron to plant ash in the Levant. So what's going on here? Because they made uh, a, a large church, about 100 metres long, with windows. Not very big windows, but windows all the way along it. They had glass vessels and so on. So here's one of the windows, a pair of window panes actually. As you can see, they're not big and they were coloured. There's lots of coloured uh, window glass. Um, it's a kind of forerunner of stained glass windows, if you like. Um, and also, we've got glass production debris. We have melting pots with glass in the bottom of the melting pots. And what we also find, however, are these glass mosaic tesserae, glass cubes from mosaics around the site. There are no mosaics, but in the workshop, there are tesserae. And it looks as if they're using these as raw material to remelt and make glass. Um, we can see that from the odd, what looks like a stone tessera stuck in a glass melting crucible which hasn't melted. And we get streaky uh, glass fragments where the red has been mixed with the green and not fully mixed. And um, opaque blue is an interesting one. Opaque blue is coloured with cobalt and made opacified uh, by, opaque by antimony. And um, uh, you can see the calcium antimony particles, about point, only a tenth of a percent cobalt in this blue. And when we look at the window panes, um, here, here's, here's a, uh, a graph showing cobalt and antimony. Um, these are the window panes here. These are the mid-blue tesserae, and these are the dark blue tesserae. And it looks as if the blue windows are made by melting mosaic tesserae. And, and Theophilus, writing as late as around 1120, tells us they were using old Roman tesserae to colour glass. And when we look at the, the, the site as a whole, the assemblage as a whole, what we find is, if we look at the weakly coloured stuff, we find that uh, there's a group of material which looks like just remelted tesserae with no cobalt blue included. The cobalt's out, everything else will melt to a kind of a murky, colourless, so-called greyish colour. And then we've got another batch which looks like fresh Roman window glass. And then we've got this stuff which is just a mixture of the two. And um, there's a history of the monastery at San Vincenzo. Uh, it's written by a monk through oral tradition in around 1130. And um, he says that the at the foundation of the monastery, it was given a temple to use the raw materials. And you still find on the site these columns of Aswan granite, which you'd expect in a Roman temple. But we think the glass probably came from the same building. They used all the raw materials they could from this temple to make the new Christian church at San Vincenzo. And so um, when we look at the baths of Caracalla in Rome today, we can see almost no glass at all. Although the architectural reconstruction by Janet Delane suggests there was a lot of glass in it. Where did it all go? It's all been re remelted down and reused. And um, it was going on for centuries, this stuff, being remelted and reused to make new glass vessels. If you look at beads in Viking Norway, you find that some of those are just the same composition. Old Roman glass, even in the 10th, 11th centuries. So just, just to sum up, um, the key things we know about this now are that we've got this primary secondary workshop division raw glass made in the east, 
um, transported out, shipped out to make glass vessels. Firings, really big scale firings of this stuff, 10 tonnes or more at a time. And over time, we have about 10 different production centres. Um, after the 4th to 5th century, there's, there's a decline. And um, the soda content of the glass, you can see that's getting lower. But also just the amount of glass in circulation is getting low as well. So things are really declining quite fast. Recycling becomes dominant in the West um, from the 7th to 8th century. And, and the availability of natron is a persistent issue all the way through, um, they're, they're trying to get more of this raw material, which, which results in this restricted location of glass production. And then the whole thing, the long Roman glass industry, ends in the 8th and 9th centuries. So thank you very much for listening. And I've got a whole load of people who have been my collaborators and, and have, have been really helpful to me over the years. So thanks to them as well. Thanks. <laughs>